Okay. All right, I'll just go to that again. Uh, good day to everyone. My name is Santa Naya. I'm the Project Officer for Partnerships and Events at Global Schools Program. Welcome to the site event hosted by Global Schools for the second time in conjunction with the Economic and Social Youth Forum, Ecosoc 2023. Aligning with Ecosoc's team as making the recovery from COVID-19 and the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development at all levels, 2023 marks a significant year towards the progression of the Sustainable Development Goals itself. However, all the progress cannot take place without a strong partnership and collaboration in different sectors as we reach the targets in SDG 70. Today, we are here gathered. We are going to speak about an innovative way to model partnerships and collaboration with schools to achieve the sustainable development goals, especially enhancing Mission 4.7 through education for sustainable development. We would love to push forward for target number 17.14, which is to enhance policy coherence for sustainable development. So partnership cannot take place, uh, policy implementation cannot take place without strong partnerships on the ground. We are going to hear from school teachers who are former advocates here. They have amazing people, education change makers, and even a call for strong partnerships right here during this event. So I hope all of you are excited. I would love uh, all of you to type in in the chat where you're tuning in from and um, your questions along the way. So let's start with uh, our first speaker. Amanda Abram is no stranger to the Global School members. She is the program manager of Global School Program and founded the Global School Teachers Advocates Program for teachers and educators to bring SDGs within school communities, curricula, and operations. Previously, Amanda has held positions in the Chilean Ministry of Education and worked on the U.S. Department of State's International Exchange Program for Young Leaders from Africa and the Middle East. She is a Fulbright Scholar recipient a UNCTAD Youth Delegate at I Environmental Education 30 Under 30 and a Global Ambassador for Quality Education on behalf of the UN Foundation. Amanda is a published author and holds a Master's in International Affairs from Columbia University and a Master's in Public Administration. Let's start off by hearing from Amanda. Hi everyone, welcome to our event that the Global Schools Program is hosting as part of the ECOSOC Youth Forum. I just want to give brief remarks to you um, to extend a welcome on behalf of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network and we hope you enjoy this event discussing partnerships and collaborations. Over the past two years, uh, the Global Schools Advocates Program has reached educators, teachers, as well as community members and parents in over 100 uh, locations, countries, and territories around the world. And we've also reached 276,000 students. And through this, we've really had the opportunity to see very innovative partnership models within um, school departments, within schools and their local communities through service learning, as well as amongst schools within our network. So we're very excited to showcase some of these examples today and also have the opportunity to hear from some experts talking about how they use um, collaboration in their own work. And I also want to mention briefly that we will be live tweeting uh, this event. So we encourage you to follow along on our Twitter page. It's at SDGs in schools. So please um, tweet and join in on the conversation today. We also will be um, compiling those messages um, to lead into a blog post that will inform the SDG summit, which is happening in September as the third day of the ECOSOC Youth Forum is all about um, these suggestions and interventions that really can shape the review of the SDGs as this year is the midpoint of the SDG agenda. So um, I'll let us get to the speakers and I'll turn it back over to you, Santa. Well, thank you so much, Amanda. 
Um, so as Amanda mentioned just now, the SDGs are in a midpoint. So in 2022, the United Nations declared that uh, education is indeed in crisis post-pandemic at the Transforming Education Summit. We saw how teachers, the community, and even different stakeholders came together when school was out and was making learning possible to happen. We saw education champions contributing their best so that no students would be left out. We saw organizations coming in to help each other to make education sustainable. So we have an amazing keynote speaker for today, Melissa Gomez, the co-founder and CEO of Advolution Enterprise, a not-for-profit education company that focuses on leadership development, teacher empowerment, and community engagement for schools and government. She was a Teach for Malaysia fellow and has combined 10 years of experience in management, consulting, and education. Melissa developed at Relation Enterprise organization strategy, led government and corporate fundraising, and managed the organization's development. She would share about the importance of strong partnerships in addressing the education crisis around the world and her own experience in Malaysia. Over to you, Melissa. Thanks, uh, Santa. Selamat petang, which is good evening in uh, Malaysia. Greetings I bring to you uh, from, you know, a land, small piece of country in Southeast Asia. Now, just to share with you a little bit about uh, Advolution, like what Santa has rightly mentioned. So Advolution works primarily on the SDG goals number four, which is our quality education. And our primary hope and our primary mission is to actually improve teaching quality in teachers, school leaders and also system leaders at the state and at the district level. Now, we, I must say that I think each and every one of us here who are present in this session must know and have heard and also agree to the SDG goals that have been outlined by United Nations as the key pillar of foundation in making sure that not just our children, but our children's children will have a sustainable world. And however, when we saw the pandemic, we saw that one of the key uh, challenges in bringing these SDG goals, in particular SDG number four, which is quality education, is where we realized that the challenges, to overcome challenges in education, is not just on the responsibility, it's not just on the shoulders of teachers, it's not just on the shoulders of the principals, the school leaders, and also all system leaders in the Ministry of Education, but it becomes the responsibility of each and every one, whether you're a global leader, a world leader, a political leader, or even leaders at the grassroots. And so that becomes a narrative that everyone right now holds that education is definitely you know, the quote says, it takes a village to really raise a child. But I guess the question and the challenge that even we, I myself, as a not-for-profit uh, leader, what one of the things that we find are most challenging is who is this village? How do we build this village? Who consists of this village? And that's a primary question that we always ask ourselves. You know, while well, the saying says it takes a village to raise a child, but the question is, who actually defines this village. And having working six years on the ground, building partnerships at the corporate, at the private, uh, at the uh, government level, one of the key challenges we find is having people with that common vision, having people who share that same narrative, that same heart for our children, our students, and our teachers. And that becomes a primary criteria when we look at in terms of building that village. A year ago, I had the privilege of listening to Wendy Kopp, the CEO of uh, Teach for America, in one of her visits in, uh, to Malaysia. Now, I think Wendy said something very, very interesting. In one of her, vis uh, in one of her meetings at the 77 uh, United Nations General Assembly, one of the things she mentioned was that something that world leaders have never talked about was that how they could actually come together, collectively solve education challenges together. So it's no longer about my Ministry of Education, your Ministry of Education, but it's collectively coming together to solve issues, educational issues collectively on the ground. 
And that's one of the things that I guess if what if this is what real leaders are talking about, then I'm sure it also translates down to the ground where teachers are also thinking, how can I work with teachers from other schools or teachers from various countries? And on the ground, bringing changes or trying to solve challenges in our classroom. And Wendy said it very uh, interestingly, that collective leadership will be one of the key features of partnerships. Then the question is, what is collective leadership? And I guess it's not, we're not just talking about leadership as, you know, it's a responsibility that belongs to someone of position and power, but it's leadership is basically people who have that passion, that vision, and that desire to make a change, but more so in creating that village, how do we consolidate or bring people with that mindset together, working in a system collectively to solve educational problems? And that's one of the things in evolution where we work with governments and private sectors. One of the key criteria is, as I mentioned earlier, looking for people with that same heart. So it's not just about raising funds, financial resources, getting resources or expertise on the ground, but more so it's about collaborating with individuals or organizations who really genuinely wants to solve issues on the ground for our children. And that's where we find where strong partnerships are developed, where people of similar vision, mission, and passion coming together, regardless of your position, regardless of where you are, but having that mindset, bringing all together your principles, combining your principles, your system of working towards solving a common issue, either in your school, in your classroom. And that's one of the strong things of partnerships that I've learned across the five years of my working experience. And I must say that I've come, I've also experienced field partnerships and good partnership. And, and that's something, you know, that I take it very dearly or myself and your organization in terms of building partnerships. And of course, some of you may ask, what kind of partnerships are there available? Or what kind of partnerships are we talking about? Now, there are various types of partnerships. And what we, uh, and just to share with you a little bit, you know, I think there are about four, three to four types of partnerships that I would strongly encourage educators or teachers on the ground to, to, to explore. Now, the most simple one is partnerships with your fellow teachers in the classrooms or in a school. So how do you, uh, a mathematics teacher, work with a science teacher towards on a common team, for example, or just strategizing to solve a disciplined issue. Another partnership that goes on another level, if you're a nonprofit or a social enterprise leader, is where we talk about partnerships, public-private partnerships, where organizations combine, uh, where organizations work together with the government bringing alongside corporates and multinationals towards uh, a vision or a mission that they intend to bring impact. So for evolution, we focus very much on public-private partnerships where we basically play the middle person between the government and corporates towards achieving our mission of building quality teachers. Another form of partnerships that you may also look at is where we talk about cross partnerships where people from the education for example work together with people in health care, combining both skills combining both uh, expertise in creating a solution that will benefit the beneficiary so these are some of partnerships uh, that i've come across and experienced throughout uh, my five years of working in a non-profit uh, social impact uh, community and one of the lessons that I've really, really learned of strong partnerships in addressing challenges is that it is important to bring people from various diverse backgrounds. What is that is important, but it's more important that we all share that same mission, vision, and that heart for the beneficiary. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa, for your keynote. So Melissa did mention yourself that partnership starts with uh, strong leadership and among the community who shares the same vision with the common agenda. So fellow teachers should uh, find common team to partner together and it should encourage more cross partnerships among different sectors. So as we move forward in understanding different partnerships that can take place, let's hear from the ones on the ground. 
the true heroes, the teachers themselves, who had their every effort to the next level in making teaching and learning happen during the pandemic and post pandemic. We are going to speak to three amazing global schools program advocates to understand what it is like having creative partnerships during the pandemic and how they sustain these collaborations post COVID. The main reason I'm highlighting the sustainable partnerships here, especially in education, is because progress takes time. Foundational learning takes time. Long collaboration takes time. The well-being being of our students takes time. And the same goes to equity and inclusion, which also takes time. We would love the audience to comment and ask questions in the chat box for our fellow advocates as we address them while we move on with our panel session. Type in your name and where you're tuning from, and we will answer them and look into it gradually. We have advocates from Italy, Egypt, and India. First up, we have Federica Patterson from Italy. She is a high school science teacher and the coordinator of the multidisciplinary departments of civics and STEM teaching at Central Studi Casnati in Como, Italy. While her advocacy in GSP, she became the chief program officer for the Casnati for ESD, a new program developed by Central Study Casnati in collaboration with Global Schools. The main objective of Casnati is to integrate ESD into the school curriculum and spread ESD knowledge and actions in web communities. Federica has a Master's of Science degree in Biology, specializing in applied biology and nutritional science and completed several postgraduate courses regarding innovative teaching and learning methodologies for sustainable development. Thank you for being here, Federica. Next up, we have Mohamed Helmi. He is the Extracurricular Activities and Events Director at the International School of Elite Education in Egypt. As a passionate educator, calm advocate, he has led many SDG focused projects, including planting 1,000 trees in Cairo's public schools and sponsoring a cloth factory for orphans, which led to winning the collaboration award in the Global Social Leaders Competition. As we were all locked in in our homes, Halmi was a hero in his own way. He actively promoted mental health social responsibility and gender equality and special needs through campaigns to raise awareness for a better social inclusion and to influence students to think globally and to act locally. For his major contributions were funding community schools, hospitals, small businesses for underprivileged people and refugees education, highlighting his biggest effort raising awareness about COVID-19 to fund oxygen generators to reduce pressure on public hospitals during the crisis. We are grateful to have you for my own. Last but not least, we have Anitu Lutra, an experienced, passionate, and dedicated teacher. Nitu currently teaches at the modern public school, Shalima in Bagh Zalhi, India, with a 20 years of teaching experience. She has been able to work with under-resourced schools in her community as an advocate to consider the sustainable development goals and education a part for now. International Teachers Award 2020 recipient and the best teacher by the District of Rotary International for the Track Club. Nitu strives to provide the best for her students by bringing in new strategies of teaching that excites her. Her students were selected as the youth the ambassadors of the 100 Ed program in association with the IBO. She holds a master's in English and was named a Microsoft Innovative Educator. Hello, Nita, and welcome to all three advocates. So let's start this conversation here. All of y'all are community champions down there. All of y'all are teachers yourself. So uh, I would pass the floor we can start with me too and then Federica and then Mohammed answers it. Um what does strong partnerships mean to you? Uh, first someone's mic is on I think. Yeah I, I would encourage all of you to mute your microphones. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone. First of all it's a great yeah am I audible clearly to everyone? Am I audible? Yeah okay. 
So first of all, uh, I would take this platform to thank Global Schools, and of course, uh, I cannot uh, proceed further without uh, naming my principal, Ms. Alka Kapoor, who actually has given me this opportunity to be here with all of you. Uh, for me, strong partnerships are grounded in common values and goals, mutual respect and trust, and experience sensibilities. Uh, so, so, so we see here that knowledge that each partner brings to the table. So it's a mutual uh, kind of mutual relationship that we develop, we develop trust, and it all depends upon hard work. We need to work hard to sustain that partnership with one another. It takes commitment of energy and time to listen, to learn, to be present, and for, to, in other you know, spheres of uh, areas you know, for, for, of work. It takes uh, sharing successes and owning missteps, openness to new and willingness to challenge and be challenged. I think this is what strong partnership means to all of us. And uh, I think you all will uh, agree to this, that first of all, trust, mutual regard with one another, then bringing newness in whatever we do. If, if I am doing something, it's basically hand, hand holding. I am holding hand of the other person and then other person also is flourishing with me, empowering one another. That is what strong partnership means. We, this is what we do in India, we do in Delhi. We have underprivileged uh, schools, many schools and government schools, wherein we go, we try to hold hands by teaching them so many many things. We, as an Interact Club uh, coordinator, I try to, uh, you know, figure out many government school, school slum areas where we go to, and we try to empower them with, with education. That is what is the need of the R. So this is how we hold hands, and this is how we proceed further. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nitu. How about you, Federica? Greetings to all and uh, thank you to the GSP team for having given me the opportunity to speak here today about the experience that we are living, uh, developing the Kaznati for ESD program. Uh, strong uh, partnerships mean uh, to me collaboration on uh, multiple levels, vertical and horizontal cooperation that uh, connects uh, the highest number of uh, variables uh, in a complex system and, uh, and uh, in a holistic way. In uh, such a complex world, we need more uh, holistic models and fewer schemes. The building of uh, holistic models also in the educational field is uh, inevitable to face so many different uh, social, economic, environmental challenges that uh, impact humanity in uh, such uh, diverse ways. Human development can just be sustainable from now on, and uh, to manage sustainable development, we need a holistic approach that starts from the school years of future generations to enhance both vertical and horizontal communication among students, teachers, families, school leaders, and local stakeholders. Thank you, Federica. How about you? How about helping? Well, uh, first, thank you all for hosting me. And uh, I would like to welcome all the um, Global Schools advocates and the people uh, and, uh, attending the uh, uh, discussion. I agree with all uh, the previous things. And one more thing uh, that I want uh, to add on that I should have a, a, a partnership, a strong partnership starts from my school. Uh, first thing, as um, uh, Melissa and the others said, and Frederica, that partnerships should start from your school. When you get your administration, students, parents, and school community stands behind you to make projects that can convince other partners and stakeholders all around to start supporting you, whether with funding or even media, to make a change in your society. So first, you should start with your own ground base in your school to have a strong partnership with your community. And then the partnerships uh, would come uh, and follow uh, with uh, understands, as they mentioned, uh, with uh, mutual interests, uh, networking, and so on. Well, thank you, Mohamed. So what I get here from three of you is that uh, trust is important. 
mutual respect is important and bringing newness is important to hold each other's uh, hands together in strong partnership to empower one another and like what uh, Nick was mentioning is important you know like you're bringing new things um, for different generations to work together in the education sector and like what Federica was mentioning we need uh, holistic models of partnership at multi levels in every way to happen and strong partnership should start from your own school community with your parents, with your teachers, uh, the community around you. And that's what uh, Mohamed Helmi was mentioning. So let's move on. Uh, speaking about your own experience, all of you are teachers on the ground. And you know we would love to hear from your own stories uh, at schools, uh, how did you get through these partnerships and how do you sustain these collaborations? Uh, so my question to you here is how you navigated the partnerships during the pandemic? What type of partnership strategies that you created and you saw during the pandemic and post-pandemic? And the type of partnership strategies that have been able to assist your teachers in schools in aspirating the education crisis recovery and how do you keep these partnerships going even post pandemic? So I'll start off with you two. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I'm back. Yeah, so uh, during pandemic, I think we all know it was an unprecedented time for all of us a tough time a challenging time but still we all managed we all managed as a team to work for the progress of the students so first of all it was teams that we installed in our school and thereafter there was no looking back we were trained uh, eventually we all were trained how to work with the uh, the students uh, through teams students were also taught so this was the first thing that we did secondly uh, we made packets during pandemic maybe we made packets of food for the again for the people who couldn't buy you know enough for them they were the 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 least uh, least you know in ones who would no one would actually go and ask for food so they were the ones who couldn't get anything for them so we made packets every day our school buses used to go so we were one of them the team used to make the packets the entire uh, you know cereals uh, rice wheat flour everything was sent to them across the the city uh, near our area where we had we had lot of slum areas so thereafter uh, this was another thing we do we have a roti bank in our school wherein every child brings a fresh fresh food for the for again for these people which is distributed on the same day so that they, it's not a stale food that they eat then we also held our principal ma'am she she you know she held a longest webinar for 24 hours that it was on mental health because that was the need of the hour at that time it was needed wherein we we were all disturbed it was a disturbing disturbing time for everyone then as a as an interact club coordinator i thought of uh, you know implementing something new for these children so then i started uh, asking the class four employees of our school we, i used to go to the school during this time and i asked because they were coming to school so i asked them uh, what about the children the children are unable to study so we i we opened a project which was named as project umeed umeed means hope so we we made that project and through online classes We used to teach them. There was a proper curriculum that we, we developed for them. It was art and craft. It was maths. All the different techniques of maths were taught. Science experiments were taught. English spoken English was taught to them. Presentations were made and they used to learn through that. They used to come, though there was a little difficulty for them because it did not have the devices, proper devices or the connectivity used to get lost. But still we tried to manage and we created this uh, project for them. And it is still going on in the school. It is uh, for the past three years it is going on. It started in 2020. Then we have an organization which is school after school in our school, which is Sarthak Priyas. Again, we work for them. We take them for picnics, we give them different uh, things to eat and it's like a birthday celebrations and so much, so on and so forth. We also go to the, we also went to the old age homes. If in, in Delhi, it's quite prevalent. We have many old age homes in India and uh, again, the old people, the elderly people, they do not get uh, the love and affection. 
celebration. So we are the ones we go there, we celebrate their birthdays, and this is how we used to treat them during uh, COVID and even after COVID. So uh, we also had, uh, you know, ha had many webinars on climate change during during COVID. During COVID, we had webinars related to environment change where uh, one of the celebrities was uh, was the uh, main speaker there um, so there and and then ews people i hope you know the economically weaker section of the society who again cannot have devices so notes homeworks everything was sent to them to their houses so that they are they do not lag behind in the class because they did not have the device they did not have good connection so this is how we help them uh, then uh, we have fit india in our school it's uh, CBSC, like it's in India, there is a there's CBSC which works doing all these things. So we are working on the the, the wellness of the students. So we are taking care of all the SDGs here, their, their health, their hygiene, and how they can, you know, sustain in this environment. So basically when we also, during COVID, we also, you know, had school uh, on library on school, on wheels, library on wheels, Science bus on wheels. So the bus used to go around. We had the entire bus with the, with all the experiments, with all the specimens and everything. It used to go to the slum areas where teachers used to go and teach them. And when the pandemic was a bit lower, like it was not so high, so we went there. We used to teach them all the different specimens and then story books. We had a library on wheels wherein the students were the children were taught. We used to take. The, to the garden the book the entire bus was uh, changed transformed into a library so that library had n, n number of books in it children used to explore the books they used to read the books and we had we also conducted so story sessions with them during pandemic post pandemic we had we used to have a road safety rules it's very important for the children to learn that time it used to be offline, like online, but now we have, now it's offline. Children are standing there and helping the other people how to, you know, manage the traffic on the roads. So it came offline. So that was again partnership for us. Uh, I'll tell you, there is a government school, two, three government school with which we are associated. We go teach them like few few days ago, few months ago, I would say we had this uh, maths uh, world maths week so world maths day i'm sorry so we went to uh, to their school taught them tangrams now how did we go there it was basically we need to first contact them whether they agree or they don't agree again it is up to them so we have to write mails to them and we need to speak to them whether we ask who can come some students can come and teach them so then we taught them tangrams we in another time we went to another school we donated books there so we took the books from the school, the, the books which library has so many books. So we took the books, we distributed the books in the school so that they, the students, again, it is a quality education that we want to provide to the students. And if we have so many, few days ago also, we, conduct, we conducted a, a, a donation, a book donation. Another thing I would like to mention here, during COVID, uh, during Diwali, you know, it's a big festival for us. So we, uh, we, uh, this, covered or we invented this joy box students was no student was coming to school we were going to school so we told the students to make a joy box which can be donated again to these people to these less privileged sections of the society so that they can have a smile on their face it was they could put anything in the joy box that joy box has to be made by them it should be a joy box should be returned and they can give clothes, they can give toys, they can give their pouches, anything, but it should not be in a tattered condition. It should be in a good condition, of course, books, everything. So for the past three years from 2020, we started this joy box. Uh, you can say uh, this uh, started in 2020 and it is still going on. Maybe we do it on Christmas, we do it on Diwali. So it's either ways. Amazing. Some boxes were left this time in this last 2021. So yeah some boxes were left so we went we went on the road near our school premises we donated it we gave the boxes to the rickshaw pullers we gave, gave it to the balloon seller we gave it to the one who, who puts the puncher the shops and they were so happy and you'll not believe i'm sorry i'm taking a little more time when i went to the balloon seller so he had that helium balloon it was 31st of december so he said this is for you. So he gave me that happy new year balloon and he returned it back to me when we were giving him. 
All right, thank you. Thank there you is so one uh, sweet you. shop, like he was mm -hmm. on the card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we have more time so for you. So you can proceed with it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You too. Sure, so I would sure, love. Sure, uh, sure. I would love thank, thank uh, to hear from Federica and Mohammad Helmi of their own experience. All right. So you have like four minutes each to you know share your own experience, Federica. Thank you. Um, so um, the COVID pandemic, but also the Ukrainian war that has been shocking the EU and uh, the intensification of uh, weather and uh, climatic anomalies have made the students more fragile from a psychological point of view and sensitive to social environmental issues. The lockdowns we passed through left us with uh, more uh, advanced, uh, advanced digital tools and a greater propensity to use them. All these uh, aspects brought uh, my school to develop a strategy for ESD integration that could make us teachers both coordinate our efforts and collect the desire coming from our students to become protagonists of their learning process, taking concrete actions in their present life and cooperating to fight the increasing sense of discouragement and anxiety. Among uh, the several strategies applied, I want to remember the development of uh, an educational structure for uh, social emotional learning through the offer of uh, DBT skills training to teachers with uh, the aim to improve our ability to capture the psychosocial emotional needs of our students, fostering the effectiveness of uh, the collaboration with, between students, teachers and families. To enhance our work, we decided to develop also the Kasnati for ESD website to let anyone be inspired by our students and interact with us. ESD is a great way to foster education crisis recovery because it spontaneously promotes collaboration and partnership between different generations and cultures breaking down geographical walls to achieve global objectives and implement social emotional learning practices. Thank you. Interesting, Federica. I like the fact that both of you started off with the well-being of the students first, uh, the mental health of students, and they know that we're going to learning. Off to you, Mohammed Helmi. Thank you. Uh, uh, our own experience in uh, Egypt, especially in my school, uh, we were all uh, uh, shocked by the uh, closures and uh, the things are uh, running fast uh, towards staying home. So our first concern was um, the mental health of our students. And I would like to thank all the people who had the image for transforming education and all the people who got the, the the load of transforming education from being physical to be uh, virtual, especially the organizations. That's why you should have like following up some of the international organizations like Council of British International Schools and so on with their all educational um, uh, courses and, uh, uh, and uh, webinars and blogs about how to transform everything to be online. One of the main uh, challenges that we faced that we didn't want our sustainable development uh, projects to be stopped. So we needed to transform everything to be virtual, like classes and so on. And to keep our students' mental health uh, better, we started to make after school uh, activities like sports, music, uh, uh, competitions for the students to team up and to uh, start to show up to each other. And one of the main ideas of the school administration was having an international um, uh, communication uh, uh, exchange program with other countries for our students to meet other countries and to talk with them about countries' uh, culture. And then uh, because we are used to have our own uh, projects, uh, our students are trained to assess the uh, situation and to uh, uh, evaluate it and to make goals that suits the needs of the community. One of the main things that we usually train our students for is to think globally and start to act locally. One of the things that we found out the whole community is doing that 
um, they're trying to uh, distribute food and um, uh, some medical um, uh, needs and so on. Uh, uh, they try to support people with low wages. So we started to think out of the books of two projects. The first one was trying to find uh, or trying to fund uh, an oxygen generator to uh, be used by one of the uh, community um, uh, society uh, uh, or NGOs to support uh, uh, the people to stay away from hospitals, to reduce the pressure on hospitals. Uh, so we made the project, we made the funds, and I was really uh, impressed with our students and parents and school community uh, responses and ideas about how to make the whole campaign online, whether by making the awareness sessions online, designing um, uh, posters and uh, uh, presentations, also by the ways they created to make the fundraising in school, like making an online gallery, an online auction uh, for uh, their kids' um, uh, portraits and draws. That's why we got a uh, large sum of money. And another, our, another, our other uh, project was uh, uh, delivering uh, water, uh, clean uh, water to uh, underprivileged um, uh, village. So we made these two projects during the pandemic. And then we started to uh, came, come back to the school after that, after the pandemic, but we kept between closure and coming back. So we started to think our goals changed according to the needs of the country at that time. We started to think about people who lost their jobs. As you know, the pandemic made uh, uh, all the efforts in the last four years for fighting poverty falling down. That's why we started to support these people by offering them small businesses, funding uh, small businesses for them to keep people uh, uh, away from poverty. And we started to support uh, uh, education for refugees and public schools by offering them stationaries and all the help they need to continue um, education, educating. And one of the main things we have done, we uh, found out that visual impaired people, they started to leave education because of high cost of paper and their uh, educational needs. We started to support them with funds and awareness campaigns about their needs. All right, that's amazing, what we did. Amazing work, uh, Mohammed. So we have a like limited time here. So we are keeping the questions to the end. Um, all right. So um, I would like to wrap up here. We learned, uh, we heard from all the advocates here. Uh, that you know, uh, we start off from mental health, taking care of the well-being of the students, and then getting the teachers together, the community together. That's what solidifies a strong partnerships. So, you know, three of you, I would uh, love three of you to actually type out in the text here, the chat here, so that our community, online community could uh, have a word from you. Like, what is your message to school teachers out there who are looking for strong creative partnerships and accelerating the teaching and learning process? So I would love three of you to type out in the chat so that you know, we keep this conversation going in the chat as well. So thank you very much uh, to the three advocates. Uh, there's a time constraint here because we have two more other speakers coming in. So the questions will be answered uh, at the end of uh, the panel sessions. Um, so we heard amazing insights from these three advocates and it is mind blowing how to see a normal educator, a normal teacher out there can be creative and looking for partnerships and have amazing solutions in sustaining these important collaborations to accelerate the education system around us. Um, Amanda had shared an important link. So some of you, I realize you are not aware of the Global Schools Program. So you can go uh, to the link shared in the chat and check while you're listening to this uh forum to site event. Um, there's a special application which is going to come out. I will share with you at the end of the program, but uh, there's a link there for you to, you know. So if you want to be like these advocates here, you have been championing uh, education for sustainable development and high quality sustainable education in your community or even if you know amazing teachers there's a special program cohort coming up for you um, we have uh, thousands of applications every year so you wouldn't want to miss it so 
uh, thank you to the three advocates. You can keep the conversation going in the chat with our fellow community. Um, next up, we have the fireside chat. So uh, I hope our next speaker is here, Samuel. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. All right. So we heard from the teachers. We heard from change makers on the ground. We have also heard from the community experts. Now let's hear the perspective from members of education-related organizations. Um, as we cannot work alone, strong partnerships between schools and different levels of stakeholders should take place in accelerating uh, education post-pandemic. It is important for schools to leverage on sustainable partnerships, like what our advocates did and mentioned earlier. Uh, a good friend to me and a former teacher himself, Samuel Isaiah is the newly appointed Head of Education Initiatives at the YTL Power International. In this role, Samuel drives strategies, process development and operations besides overseeing education programs and organizations funded by YTL. Prior to this, he was the program director for Pemimpin GSL, which is Pemimpin Global School Leaders, a nonprofit that empowers teachers in Malaysia to enhance school leadership and teaching quality. He was the very first Malaysian teacher to be the top 10 finalists of the Waki Foundation's Global Teacher Prize in 2020 and the first recipient of Anugrah Harapan Merdeka 2020. Over his 12-year career, Samuel's education in improving education for rural uh, orang asli indigenous communities and teachers in Malaysia established him as one of the Asia's most influential education for two years in a row, 2021 and 2022. He is also the co-founder of the Malaysia Teacher Prize to celebrate exceptional educators in the country and Ladakh Plus, Malaysia's first teacher professional development application. So we are indeed honored to have you here, Samuel, despite your busy schedule. Uh, so let's keep the conversation going on strong partnership. So uh, you were a former teacher and now you have mm -hmm. different roles in uh, different organizations. So what does partnership look like? during your transition from a teacher to these roles? Could you share some examples? Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Santa, for inviting me today. I think it's always an honor to speak to you and your team and the amazing initiative that you've been doing over the years. Partnerships, wow. Uh, I think at all levels, we always talk about this. Uh, I just came back from a, a, a trip to India, visiting some um, uh, uh, philanthropic foundations as well and everybody always talks about partnerships everybody everyone recognizes that working in silos is definitely not the way to get things done but for some reason uh, it's always a challenge and as I transition from from a teacher I think in, in for me when I was a teacher I felt that a lot of things that I was doing with regards to partnering with community members or partnering with other teachers or partnering with the kids, collaborating with the kids in whatever that I was doing felt very genuine. Uh, it felt that a lot of the things that we're doing came from a common interest, a common goal. There were no uh, other side interests, you know, if you get what I'm saying, um, that it, uh, not to offend anybody, we didn't care about the SDGs, right? We didn't care about the theories. We didn't care about World Bank reports. All we wanted to do was to get things done was to help one another, was to empower one another. It's very genuine in that sense. And as I transition uh, from my role as a teacher and currently with different organizations as well, I think the learning is the other way around. I expected to learn. Of course, I am learning a lot of things right now in my job, but the learning is, is the other way around. A lot of organizations and a lot of foundations are going back to hyper-local collaboration, which fundamentally means working with small groups of people in a small demographic area, truly understanding what they need, what they want, elevating their voices, elevating their needs, elevating their truest desires and working on that instead of coming up with a prescriptive solution that we expect uh, you know, communities that we work with to actually uh, implement or adapt. I think, yes, the, the transition is, 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 is a bit of a back and forth. And I think um, uh, kudos to a lot of teachers here. And I think when we want to talk about, about collaboration, perhaps you don't need to talk about 
individuals from organizations. Let's talk to teachers. Uh, I think teachers are fantastic in the sense that everything that they have done worked in practice. It worked in practice. There was no theory behind it. Uh, there is no framework behind it. It's like they get things done. So I think there's a lot for us to learn from teachers. And that's what I've been learning so far, that if we can learn from teachers, if we can learn from local campaigns, uh, see how they work in practice and then let the expert figure out the theory, right? Instead of figure out the theory, get it done, uh, get it done on the ground. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really a believer that local champions, uh, individuals working on the ground, uh, really has a huge role to play when we speak about collaboration. Let's ask them. Wow, uh, you know, hats off to all the teachers here, hats off to you as well, <laughs> being a, a former teacher yourself. So. Uh, going back to partnerships, so sometimes mm -hmm. uh, wrong partnerships do occur, like you tend to, you know, uh, have wrong partnerships. So in your opinion, why are strong and creative partnerships important for school? And what are the disadvantages that sometimes we get from wrong type of partnerships? Because partnerships really have to look uh, based on your resources that you have, you know, mm. and the resources that you need. Mm. Mm -hmm. Why and what kind of uh, partnerships that you should go out and look for? I think it's really tough to draw that line uh, and define which is a wrong partnership and which is then uh, a lot of times you just get into it and then you figure things out, either figure, uh, figure out how to make it sustainable or to scale it or figure a way an exit strategy in that sense. But I think in whatever decision making that I have done when I was working in the community, whatever they're doing now, it's always important that before you foster any sort of partnership, it's to truly understand and truly define the problem. Uh, get, do get your homework done. If you're working with community members, make sure that you speak to them, you engage with them as much as possible, that you truly understand what is the specific need of the community that you're working with. If you're working with teachers, if you're working with different organizations, it's, it's about the same. Uh, but the intention behind it has got to be genuine as well, in the sense that, how are we, sometimes I think we also go, uh, we, we, we do a needs analysis, we speak to communities with the agenda in mind, uh, with the agenda that we have a solution. So sometimes it's always important to actually put that, that prejudices aside, put that things, the idea that you know a lot of things aside and try to learn from the communities that you're working with. I think that's most important. Identify the problem, really identify the problem and learn from the uh, communities you're working with. But most importantly, I think when you do these two, two things, you'll be able to realize, you, you will realize that I think sometimes people get into a partnership that is over-reliant on the partner. You expect the partner to get all the things done. Partnerships work both ways, right? Everybody has got an equal weight to pull. So once you have clearly defined the situation, once you have clearly defined the problem, I think what you can then do is to find multiple solutions or multiple partners to work on small areas instead of finding like a huge partner to just come and solve a lot of things. Uh, I was meeting a few organizations the other day as well. Certain non-profit organizations or certain foundations, what they are doing right now is they are helping uh, organizations within the social impact space to help them identify a niche, to help them identify an area that they want to work with, to and help them identify an area of development within the organization and then find another organization to help that organization to improve. So it is about really defining areas that you want to improve specifically. If you're taking everything as, as I, I, I think there would be a lot of disadvantages because when you get solutions, I think sometimes we are very, uh, uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I think I used to be in this position where we are infected with this disease I call, infected with this disease I call solutionitis. Um, I mean, we, 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 we look for one solution. We assume that there is a one-size-fits-all kind of solution. If there's a book, there's a module, there's a framework uh, that I want to implement right away, it doesn't work that way in real life, unfortunately. Life is not that linear. I hope it was. It made things so much easier, but it's not. So try to find multiple solutions. Try to find different partners for you to work with. I think, yeah. Yeah, as you said, we can't, uh, you know, work with only one partner and, you know, mm -hmm. it should go always. And we, we, it's not only about taking solutions from the partners, you know, we have to work both ways. 
Um, Today, as you hold different managing positions mm. in organizations and you go back to school and you look mm. uh, at schools and you think twice before you partner. So what do you actually look for when it comes to partnership among schools? What are the specific uh, items uh, besides looking at the niche problem that they need to mm. solve and partner in? Great question. Uh, I think one of the key areas that I look for is leadership. Uh, a lot of organizations a lot of interventions, a lot of programs fail because of poor leadership or because of the over-reliance of the leadership of one state individual. So I would, re I, would, I would attempt to see how does the leadership structure work in the state school or in that state organization? How invested are they in that ideal or in that, in that cause that they are fighting for? So leadership is extremely important. Um, another area that I'll look at is probably innovation. I know it's not about reinventing the wheel anymore, but I'm always looking at people, or individuals or organizations who see things differently, who are doing things dif completely differently, uh, uh, or is looking at a different angle, something that which we have just overlooked for a very long time. And you just have that, why didn't I think of that moment, right? So that is something that I look at as well. Last but not least, I also think uh, what I look for uh, is potential to scale. I think this is extremely important. Um, whether it's an intervention, whether it's a solution, whether, it, you know, whatever it is, it must have the potential to scale. Uh, yes, it can come in various uh, forms or, uh, you know, it, it could, could change entirely, but it must have that potential to scale. So yeah, um, leadership, innovation, and uh, potential to scale. So that is an important message out there to teachers. Uh, leadership, innovation, and potential to scale. Remember that. Yeah, yeah. Because I think uh, these three aspects definitely leads towards sustainability. You can't mm -hmm. have sustainability without poor, with, uh, when there's poor leadership. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. It does, it's just not sustainable. Uh, so it's all interrelated in that sense, I believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I have two more questions for you. Um, in your opinion, how does the education system around the world should prioritize strong partnerships and collaboration and why? How should... How Sorry? does the education system around the world should prioritize strong partnerships and collaborations? I think the first part would be to work with one another. But I think that is something that... Uh, different organizations, like what you guys are doing here, being in different schools, coming together, that, that's easy. Uh, and I'm, not, I'm not implying that it's easy, easy to do, but to get people together, it's, it's, it's fairly easy. It's something that is a work in progress. But I think that for whatever that we want to do is we need to work with the government. Um, yeah, if you don't work with the government, you can kiss and everything goodbye. You can have the most innovative idea in the world, but you don't have good ties with the government. You don't partner with them. Um, I believe that is a huge stumbling block to whatever whatever that we want to do. Uh, and it's also, it's also important to remember uh, that we should not be creating something that is parallel to what the government is doing. Um, I've seen in some countries um, uh, to great success where organizations and foundations actually provide a different, an alternative to what the government is doing. The government has laid out a different type of policy, a few policies, for example, let's just say to combat literacy. Uh, you don't go and conduct a program that is completely the opposite in that sense, right? Try to find a way that you can work with the government to reach the government's goal because the government's reach is massive. Anta. As much as I would like to say that, you know, we can reach as many, as many teachers, as many students with our sessions, the government can, can do that almost instantaneously. So it's always important for organizations to think how, that we, how we can work, work uh, work with each other instead of creating something parallel then you end up competing with one another um and but i think on the end of both the organizations that i work with or governments i think uh, it's always the understanding that we need each other uh, that is very important uh, governments are slowly moving towards that i think towards the understanding that tpp is something that we really want to do i think we can talk about public private partnership all day long but there is there is no political will um, you can, it's, it's just not going to work. It's just going to, going, to, going to be a phrase that's overused with little or no effect. So try to work with the government. Uh, everybody here, try to work with the government. It could be, I'm not just saying central government, right? Uh, work with the local government, uh, work with the district government, work with your state education uh, uh, 
department or your district education department try to work with these individuals in power and then you will see, I, and then i will see that that is the key to strong partnership amazing um i will have one question from the audience uh what can international bodies do to carry local communities along the way to achieve the sustainable development goals so you talk I, about yeah so i think international bodies they 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 obviously have uh partners smaller organizations i think that is what this is the first thing that i spoke about hyper local collaboration to really amplify amplify the importance of these smaller organizations within the bigger ecosystem we speak about an ecosystem i think melissa spoke about states of village to nature what are the smallest players within that that the most influential players empower them work with them uh, it's if not it'll just always be seen as a huge policy um, i also think that it is important for you know international organizations to communicate their efforts in a way that the general public understands i think that's most important uh, i i i was in this this i i know some of the audiences are from india uh, sada i told you the other day i was in rajasthan uh, and i was in this this uh, institution called the barefoot college very interesting place you guys need to go check it out it's called the barefoot college i think it generally implies that for any individual that wants to go to the school you don't need any paper qualifications so they 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 what they do is they train uh, illiterate uh, village members and all of that generally but their communicating strategy i'm just going to highlight their communication strategy it's very interesting it's a very rural part of india uh, where they still use puppets you know those paper mache puppets communicate different types of ideas they find ideas that work within the communities that work so they talk about um democracy they talk about political discourse so many complex things to kids to adults to illiterate uh, individuals within that within the community to puppet so it is effective we work with them uh, uh, the community is one that uh, loves their cultural inheritance so they respond really well to things like this so i think finding that right communicating strategy uh, communication strategy could be different across the group for finding the right one to make a big difference thank you so much several i i think i could speak to you the whole day about partnerships and collaborations so you know um i know audience out there you know would love to reach out to you so uh all of you can reach out to all our speakers to linkedin professionally and uh for belation teachers the belation teacher prize uh application is open yes it is yeah please apply do apply for the malaysia teacher prize uh, i think the uh thanks santa for bringing that up i completely forgot about it so the malaysia teacher prize is an effort to empower teachers nationwide is an effort to uplift the teaching profession in malaysia i think all of us here believe that quality education stems from quality teachers it does not it does not go away from that but we want to empower teachers in malaysia the winner of the malaysia teacher prize this year takes away 50000 ringgit uh to do whatever the individual wants uh so do apply at malaysiateacherprize.org the closing uh for the application is on July the 2nd so yeah malaysiateacherprize.org send your application now thank you samuel thank you for being here today uh so we had a great session with samuel i hope you know all of you you know take into the message leadership innovation and uh the possibility of scaling um if you have any questions the audience say you can post it later and the conversation can go on uh through the chat thank you samuel uh so we will carry on to our next session i will call for partnership uh so before uh, i forget uh in align with the malaysian teacher prize uh, uh uh application global school is opening up our advocates cohort 2020 application as well so if you want to be like uh, our fellow advocates here um and the application is up so you can uh see uh, today so if you want to be a global schools advocate or if you know amazing teachers out there who can be a, a amazing global schools advocate the application is going to be open today and you can apply So thank you to our amazing speakers. So next up I have my colleague here Hafiz Jawad. So Hafiz who is uh, one of the project officers for partnerships and events. 
uh, at Drupal Schools. He is a climate activist and sustainability advocate from Pakistan. He works with the WWF Pakistan. He was a delegate at COP27 and COP26 and also the country focal point for COI17, COI16. Due to his work in policy advocacy, youth engagement and climate activism, he was invited by the US Department of State on an international leadership exchange program in the US on air quality and climate change. So today, Jawad is going to share with you on how you could partner with Global Schools Program. Over to you, Jawad. Hi, Santa. Thank you so much for moderating this wonderful session. And I think we already have discussed about how students and teachers can join this next cohort of a Global School Advocate. But let's also discuss about how organizations can reach out to Global Schools Program for partnerships and events. So I would like to share my screen as well. So let me just... Yeah, I think it's... Uh... You can see my screen, right? Okay, so uh, hello everyone. This is a partnership and events team under the Global Schools Program. Uh, we have this wonderful team. Uh, we have Amanda Brom, who is our program manager with Global Schools Program. And then uh, myself and Santa, we are the project officer with Global Schools Program. And we uh, take care of the partnerships and events under the Global Schools Program. So before uh, starting for the partnerships, let's also take a look at the events that we have attended the last year. So I think we have attended all the key events uh, the last year about the education and the climate change as well. So starting from the Transforming Education Summit, our program manager Amanda was there and Santa as well was there representing Global Schools Program. And apart from that, we, we also have organized many panels of the ministers of education from Ghana, Finland, and Greece and other countries at the uh, summit. We have attended UN Youth Assembly and also the COP27 as well. And we, we already have partners uh, who are working with Global Schools Program on developing the content and uh, outreach as well. So starting from world's largest lesson, and then we have universities like Columbia University, and then we have this Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizen, SEMA Academy. So we have these partners under our banner. So uh, moving on, what objectives do we have under Global Schools Program for the partnership? So basically uh, our focus areas are underneath, like we, for example, want to work on the education on the sustainable development goals. So you all know the first mandate of the Global Schools Program is the ESD, Education for Sustainable Development. So any organization who is working on ESD or SDGs, we are interested to work with them. And then another area is curriculum development because this is, uh, the most, uh, I would say, demanded uh, in the K-12 education system. So there should be a global curriculum that uh, students can, you know, basically uh, learn about and teachers can adopt easily at any level. And then how we can basically integrate the sustainable development. There are new concepts like global citizenship education. So we have to learn about conflict resolution and how the negotiation skills work. So we have to teach those skills to the students as well. So global citizens, uh, citizenship education is also very important area for global schools program. And then, uh, digital inclusion is so important because now after especially after the COVID-19 so the digital inclusion is most you know uh, should be replicated anywhere in the world so there should be more resource sharing and the more 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 and more outreach and we also work on the teachers training program so how we can improve the uh, teacher uh, teachers and their training programs and last but not not the least the global values and competencies so our students can learn about how they can uh, act as a global citizen in the international development uh, scenario so based on these areas our partners can be the content partners, the network partners, or the funding partners, or the research partners that we already have in our uh, global school program. So moving on, uh, this is important to highlight that we work on all tiers. So if we talk about the global scale, the global level, we have the Global Schools Program has a presence at the UN level. 
we are in the UN system and we, we represent the global school program in the best way we can. And coming down to the regional scale, to the regional level, we have organized so many events. We have partnered with the regional organizations to uh, basically integrate the global schools program and SDG at the, uh, at the regional level as well. And then the most important area for us is the local level because we work directly with the with the schools, with the teachers, with the students. So this is important that the global schools program has its presence at the local level. So if we if you just look uh, how we work with the uh, with the organization, with the students, with the with the teachers, we have presence at all levels, and this is so important for our program. Um, so before concluding, we have these strengths that uh, we cherish as well because global schools program like every year we have new 300 schools that are included in our uh, global schools program and then we have expanded like just in 2022 we ex expanded to 1560 schools in 107 countries and this is not i would say uh, the, uh, the lesser the network encompasses uh, 1 lakh 19,000 teachers and similarly 14 lakh students as well. And this is one of the largest K-12 network in the world. And uh, Global Schools Program has a benefit of having international recognition due to its uh, positioning with UN SDS and United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is, you know, works under the auspices of the former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. Uh, so we have uh, the world class experts who make who create our content, uh, including from the Harvard and Columbia University. We have these global school staff and projects officer from all around the world, uh, representing all the uh, cultures and uh, the traditions. So if you have any uh, any questions about the partnership or you want to show any regarding the partnership. You can reach out to us anytime. Uh, so uh, that's it from my side. I think. Thank you. Uh, pass on to you, Santa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jawad, uh, for the call of partnership. So I I know that a lot of teachers out there, a lot of educators out there, um, would love to partner with us. So you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, however, um. Uh, you can start this partnership by being our advocate. So the Global Schools Program Advocates uh, program application for class 2023 is finally open. If you are an educator who is passionate about education for sustainable development or even most amazing education change makers out there, please apply. It is a very competitive as the years go by. And we had amazing advocates from the past uh, who are doing tremendous efforts here that you have seen here. Um, the application is open from 25th of April until 25th of May. So uh, I would allow Amanda to come in. Amanda, you're here to share a little bit. Hi, Santa. I won't take up too much time since we're at the end of our session, but just to say, please join us at the Global Schools Program. We really uh, welcome all um, teachers and educators and school admins and people working at the local level in schools to join the Global Schools Advocates Program. The links have been shared in the chat and you can find all information on our website with how um, to join either at the school level or as an individual um, as a Global Schools Advocate. As an advocate, you will receive um, free training on sustainable development and education for sustainable development, and you will also have um, the opportunity to engage on uh, global professional development live sessions with educators all over the world. There are many advocates um, on this call, so we also thank you for all of your contributions um, to the program as we uh, continue expanding our network and improving uh, the training. And so we're very, very excited to open the applications today and to have the opportunity to uh, work with more educators and communities all over the world. As Santa said, it's open until May uh, 25th. So please check out the website and uh, submit the short form to join our network. Thank you so much, Amanda. So from our own experience, Jawad and I, uh, both of us were advocates and today we are working with the Global Schools Program team. 
So we really hope you could reach out to us for further collaborations and strong partnerships as we champion our mission in education for sustainable development. Uh, lastly, thank you so much for the Global Schools Program team, Amanda, Jawad, Raquel, and everyone behind the scene who you know put these side events together. It was a busy time for us in gearing up for the application as well. So we hope to see all your applications coming in. And thank you to the audience. Thank you to the speakers who are from around the world who tuned in. Uh, continue following our social media. Um, thank you to every teachers here who have championed strong partnerships in your community. Um, so we hope to see you all again in the next event. And thank you for supporting all of us. Have a great day ahead.